I want to thank you all for coming. And I would like to thank uh, the Art League for getting this rescheduled quickly, because if, if you don't know, I was snowstormed out. And, oh. and I want to thank Diana. She has helped me twice to make sure this is going to work, has lent me a computer, and has been very supportive. And so she's also going to push the button that makes the slides go. <laughs> so please give her your full support. <laughs> So this presentation um, I developed specifically for Art League. When they had an opening and were waiting for people to give um, presentations, I thought, well, I could do that. But how do I tie together the bumblebees and art? So I thought about it being how digital photography has influenced citizen science. And uh, most of you know me as a photographer. You may not know that for the last five years, I have helped the DNR survey bumblebees in the state. And they have a new program because the last time they did a full statewide service was, or, um, survey was 1937, wow. which is a long time and a lot has happened with bees since then. So it's been really exciting to do. I'm happy to share that with you today. If you have any questions, let me know. We have the slideshow in five pieces because it's very photo intensive. And when you have a lot of photographs in a PowerPoint, they tend to gag. And so we have five pieces, and Deanna will switch us in pieces. And when she switches us in pieces, I'll pass out some of the things I brought that you can look at. OK? If you have any questions, please ask me. I'm Ann Riley. And I'm really happy to share this with you. And I hope it's not too technical. Yeah. OK. So this guy is a male brown-belted bumblebee. And he is patrolling. Yeah. If you notice, he has very large eyes, the better to see the girls with. Oh. OK, so he's perched on this. Brand, he's perched on this flower going, where's the chicks? <laughs> okay, so go ahead. All right, so we're talking about citizen science. This term was coined in about uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And actually, um, various countries, some call it community science, whatever. And what it is, is generally defined as collection and analysis of data based on somewhat untrained volunteers participating. And so typically, you know, members of the general public are working with somebody who is more knowledgeable than them, which is true in the case of me working with um, bu the Bumblebee Brigade for the DNR. Okay, so citizen science, citizens have always been participating in scientific studies. I don't know how familiar you are with some of the maybe uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, some of the tremendous exploratory things people did, especially I'm thinking of some of the British explorers, you know, um, the gentlemen who went down and tried to go across the Antarctic and all, all that kind of thing. So there have been people trying to do science for many, many, many years, but it has become more popular. You know, bird watchers have always reported their birds, but this is always required to have some sort of an expert with them, perhaps. So the participation of a general citizen was somewhat limited then because they either had to be really highly trained or someone had to be looking over their shoulder. And if we did photography, it wasn't very effective at that time. We're next. next one. Yeah. So how many people here have done film photography? Like just about all of you? Because you're of an age where you didn't have an option. I started doing photography when I was 12 years old. And I had a, uh, you know, the little square cube on the top of my camera, and my film was in the little cage, you know, in the little cartridge, and I was shooting black and white pictures of my uncle's black and white cows. Oh. And I got thrown out of the barn because with the flash, the cows started to kick. Oh. So, so I had to leave. So you may recognize the, the um, cameras were bigger. You had to had little dials to set your settings. You had spools to thread your film on mm -hmm. and drop it in with, an, and then your the um, enlarger. And it was costly and it was time consuming. And you never knew if anything turned out. Yeah. You know, I take a roll of 36 pictures, and if I got three or four that were really good, that was extraordinary mm -hmm. and costly. Okay. So the limitations. It was, um, editing was just about impossible. Uh, photos were only available in print. The photographer didn't know if it turned out. The equipment was expensive, it was bulky, it was heavy. So the digital photography has changed all of that. Okay, everything is smaller, it's quick, it's portable, it is improving all the time. And so it's eliminated, go ahead the restrictions of the film photography. 
The high quality cameras are compact and easy to carry. Most of your cell phones probably have a camera better than the first one I ever used or the first one you ever used. Um, the images are available instantly. You know if they turned out. They can be edited easily and extensively and you can take the picture with a single click of a button. The miniaturization has helped to promote this stuff being uh, integrated with phones and, and watches. And so the average person has at least one really good camera with them, so probably almost all the time. So this is the status of bumblebees in Wisconsin prior to 2018 when the DNR started their bumblebee brigade, also known as B3 program. And the last official state survey was in 1937. Now, some counties have done surveys more. This, this is the known distribution of the rusty patch bumblebee, which you've probably heard of, which is our only federally endangered bee in the state of Wisconsin. And the places that have done some additional surveys are cross-hatched. But you can see it's very spotty. Some places haven't been done. So this is kind of where things were before B3 started. Now with B3, because it's volunteers, if we were to redo this map, there would still be a couple of counties in white because there's just no volunteers there. Or perhaps it's heavily wooded, which isn't a whole lot of bumblebees in the, in the woods. So this is kind of where it started out. Go ahead. Okay. So the B3 is citizen-based, photography-based, with public volunteers. And we photograph the whole time the bees are out, which is either very, very late March or generally early April, although last year it was very late April. And until the time the last bee dies, which is usually, believe it or not, sometime in late November. And those are the males that are hanging on to that point. Okay. So we still don't know a whole lot about the distribution of all of Wisconsin species. And we're working on that. The mission of the Bumblebee Brigade is to improve the understanding, management, and conservation of the bumblebees in relation to Wisconsin. And that conservation includes trying to provide or improve or maintain habitat for bumblebees. There are some bees that like wet spots under the forest. And that was a female black and gold bumblebee. Excuse me. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. so we'll see if I, I can have one. Yes, ma'am. You showed the bumblebee at the beginning and said it was a male. I did. Does the female have smaller eyes? Generally, yes. Generally, most bumblebees um, have smaller eyes. It's only certain species of males, two or three, that have enlarged eyes. And, <laughs> or they might have somewhat enlarged eyes. And generally, when in a, you see a bee with an enlarged eye, that will be one of the criteria for determining what species it is. Okay. All right. So the, um, this is the objectives of Bumblebee Brigade. And what you see here, just for example, is a map for this particular species of bee. This is where, in the last five years, this bee has been observed. If it's white, one of two things is happening. Particularly, if you notice, this is a bee that's in the more northern part of the state. Although historic records have this bee in the state of Wisconsin, except for the bottom row of our counties. Okay? But this is where you see it now. So if it's empty, it means either it hasn't been observed there yet, or there's nobody in that county looking. Because we're all volunteers. And one thing Bob and I do when we travel is sometimes we stop someplace where we'll, we'll actually contact the V3 people and say, do you have a county park or something you want to, you have, nobody's looking at? We'll stop and, and take a look and see what we can find. But, um, oops, I didn't, but that's okay. Um, so we, they try to assess the habit, habitat conditions and determine the conservation threats. And we're looking to determine baseline populations. Which of our bees do we have lots of? Where do we have them? Okay, and that's the tricolored bee down there. That was, that, that's fine, that's fine. Tricolored bee, this bee is kind of interesting. When you look to ID bees, you gotta look at their face, their back, and their abdomen, because all those things are characteristics that are usually definitive for what it is. But, this part, but people who work with the bees start to call them by different things and also talk about their markings. This particular bee I consider to have a Batman marking on her abdomen. And I mentioned that on her thorax, and I mentioned that to somebody else who's a bee expert, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. So anyways, there's the bee with the Batman thing. <laughs> Okay, so how bumblebees 
B3 reacts? Well, citizen scientists react with the DNR people in two different ways. First of all, they do have some hands-on training, and that's where I first got acquainted. Um, my husband and I belong to the Natural Resources Foundation, and there was this class about bumblebees, and I asked my younger son, did he want to go with me? And he said, sure. So we went. I didn't know it was recruiting people for B3, but I thought it was pretty cool. Here's my interest in photography, along with my interest in the natural world, and I thought it melded the two. And what was also really neat is using the digital photography, because in Minnesota, they were still catching the bees in little jars and getting stung. So I thought, this is kind of really interesting. So they also do in-person training. They do a whole lot of training. Um, we've had a couple of training things um, online and, you know, um, what do you call it? Yeah, the Zoom meetings where they're talking about different things. So they keep updating things. Their website is just full of all sorts of training opportunities for people. And you just get better with experience. Okay. All right, so this is, for example, their resource page. It's really small. I don't expect you to read it. I'm just trying to give you some sense of what's out there. They have species profile pages with that little map you saw for each species, a write-up on what they look for, pictures that were taken. We have field guides, which I'll show you some examples of, identification quizzes with pictures, seminar recordings, and all sorts of book lists and educational resources. So it's really, really helpful. And yes. part of your um, equipment, do you use a telephoto lens? I do, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail later. But yes, I use a telephoto lens, and I put it on automatic focus. Some of the experts recently, we had a Zoom meeting, and people were asking, what do you use? And they're like, oh, manual focus. You've got to go with manual focus. And I'm like, you know, when the wind is blowing this in front of my bee, and I am on manual focus, my focus is going like this, and I have no idea if I've got the bee in focus. But if I put it on automatic focus, and it goes like this, I assume when it goes this way, I'm back on that bee. Uh -huh. And so that's why I use my automotive. And, and it's, you know, an, if you've done a single lens reflex with a 250 lens on it, it's heavy. You need two hands to run it. So it's, it's hard to get up there and push buttons and change settings and, and do that too. Okay. So the role of the citizen scientist is to, to spot the bees, to take pictures of them, to, now you gotta do individual bees. It's not good to get pictures of two bees and mix them, especially if you mix a male with a female, they will reject you. And you need to uh, note the date, the time, where you took it, and if possible, they've asked us to start identifying the plant that it's on. And it's fine if you can, if you, it's fine if you can't. Then they want you to photograph the bee's back, side, and head and face, because these pictures provide critical information to correctly identify bees, and I'll show you some problems later. They, then you select the best three to five pictures that conform, confirm the species and sex of the bee. Now that can be trippy because if I see a bee that don't laugh, my husband knows how many pictures of things I have, how many bee pictures. I probably shoot between one and 2,000 pictures of bees every summer. And you have to look through them all. And I do this especially when it's a bee I think I haven't seen before or there's something special about it and the breeze is blowing. You know, 60 pictures is not unusual for one bee. Okay. So, and then you have to submit your observations and the photos on their website. We'll show you a little more like that. Okay, here's some sample photographic results. This were taken by my son, Ben Riley, who went to the program with me. And he used his um, uh, hand, you know, the little digital phone for, with the camera. Most people who have a digital camera in their phone or right now have one better than mine. My digital phone and my camera really is not good. And I, I shake a little bit, it's hard to, to hold it even with two hands, so I get blurry pictures. So I am not a, fa a fan of taking pictures with my camera, or my, with my cell phone, but my son and his girlfriend have really, really good cameras, and these are perfect pictures for identification. You've got, this is a northern amber bee, which are very neat, short hair, really pretty longer bodied bees. Um, I do not, have not seen them down in this county, but they are supposedly here. Um, I have seen them in his, his county, which is uh, Wapaka. He's up near Green Bay. And they're all over the purple clover out farm fields. So you've got your face photo. You can see this one has a yellow face, a hairy yellow face. You've got, what, uh, this is what's supposedly passing here for the back photo, but I like it. I call it a three quarters photo because I can see that there's a marking on the back. I can see all the different parts of the abdomen. You see those kind of sections. Those are called turgas. They're body sections. 
And that's important to be able to say what color each turga is from top to bottom. And then I can see, this is going to sound really funny, I can see under the wing pit, which is the equivalent of an armpit. Okay? <laughs> and there are two circumstances in which the color under the armpit tells you what bee it is. Because there's so many, there's so many that look like that. And the last one is a side photo, which shows the back part, shows the wings are dark, lets you start counting those turga, take a look at the other features of the bee. So this is what we're trying to get, or something similar to this, for every bee we send in. Certain times, a given picture can actually provide all three. But it depends on the species of the bee. Okay? So there are two kinds of surveys that the Bumblebee Brigade can do. And the first one is called a small area survey. This is not for me. This is generally done with two people together in a de designated area, what is it, a 100 meter wide circle, and you walk through it, decide what pattern you're going to follow, and count every bee as you walk, and identify it on the wing as you go through, and track it, and keep count, okay? And of course, you've got to determine the sex and stuff. I'm not that good. People told, and the majority of the B3 volunteers aren't. Most, the majority of the observations that come in are done as what are called incidental observations, which is like, I went out to my garden and I saw a bee and here's the picture, kind of thing. So um, it was kind of funny because um, last year we went to a presentation up at the Arboretum in Madison by some bee experts and they're like, oh, you'll get used to it, you'll get, you'll, you'll get to do it. And I'm like, no, I've been doing this for four years now and I can't do this. This is not me, I just can't do it. So the second thing is that incidental survey is just random, you know, and it might be that you are surveying that you're out for half an hour in a particular like rotary gardens or something. And so you're doing a survey, but because it's not that planned hundred feet wide circle, it is incidental. It still counts just as much. So when you talked about following the bee, I mean, are they looking for where their homes are or, or just? Well, that's one thing, but um, you could, they'd love to know that, truly so. <laughs> the other thing, though, is when you follow the bee, you're a flower, you're a flower. My bee is there, and it went there. Now, if I've got two pictures of the bee that I need there, can I follow them over to that place? or? Are there five other bees just like it over here? So you have to make sure you're tracking the bee. And it can be a problem with wind, other bees. You know, some of them you think, oh, that's really a cool bee, and I better take his picture. But it flew away before you could get any pictures. So it can be very frustrating. These are some Bumblebee Brigade participants in action. Based on the fact that they're all standing near each other with their pictures, they are not doing a small survey. They are doing incidentals, okay? Yeah. And you can see they all have long telephoto lenses. Um, you can see they're in a patch of milkweed. So I'm not quite sure what bee they might be photographing, but the milkweed is best pollinated by very large. Actually, the milkweed evolves to be pollinated by large butterflies. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, there are 400 species of bees in Wisconsin. Oh my gosh. Of those, 85% are solitary bees. That means she makes a nest, she lays her eggs and leaves. Okay. If you've ever seen those suggestions to make the little houses of the little straws for the bees, those are solitary bees. They're going to go in there, lay their eggs and leave. 15% okay. are social bees. That means mom stays home with the kids for a while. Bumblebees are social bees, and that's the box um, with the, the green ones in the middle here, the 5% right there, that's bumblebees. And only one of these 400 species is not native, and that is your friendly honeybee. Okay, so that is the only one. And they're the only ones who make colonies of that size. Um, my son is going to do bees the first time, and I was talking with Julie, whose family's done bees. When you buy bees for a beehive, you buy at least 5,000 to 10,000 bees. That's a lot of bees, especially if they're mad at you. Okay, so go ahead. So there's, it's really important with, when you talk about any particular um, natural item to use the scientific name because what you and I call well, bindweed, you know, down in Texas they call it fenceweed or something. And so it's important to do the scientific name and that's with bumblebees too. So bombus is all the bumblebees with one exception. Um, and so it would be bee, and then Borealis is the northern amber bee. And like all living creatures, they have a two-part scientific name. They belong to the genus Bombus. 
The species name is unique and can be a descriptive term. For example, borealis a nor is a term meaning boreal forest, which is northern. So it's a northern bee. Or it could be, um, there's one called navanensis, which is from Nevada. Um, so there's all different ways to name it. Or it can be named after the person who found it. Um, bumblebees have a common name that's used in the non, um, non-scientific context, like here, the northern amber bee. Okay. So in Wisconsin, of the 20 bees that have been historically found in Wisconsin, one is federally endangered, which is the rusty patch bee. You will be happy to know that Janesville and Milwaukee and Madison are in a hot zone for the rusty patch bee that extends up into Minneapolis and down into the Chicago area. It's almost kind of like an arc. Really a lot of rusty patch activity here. They're in my yard, and they've been in our yard for, for a while, which is exciting. Okay, there are um, the rusty patch, if the DNR gets a report of a rusty patch B, they have 24 hours to notify the Forest Service that they have spotted it. And recently, a couple of nests have been found in the Milwaukee area. There are seven species that are of great conservation need. That means that they're kind of declining. There's not as many as we'd like there to be. And we need to watch, the, watch out for these, try to recreate habitat, habitat, try to support them. Three are called information needs. And these three are what are called cuckoo bees. And if you hear of cuckoo bees, those are parasites on other bumblebees. And so a regular bumblebee, a a bombus bumblebee, will create a nest. These guys will wait till she's got workers, come in and and kill or disable the queen, take over the workers. They do these, uh, and then they lay their eggs, and they have the other people's workers take care of them. And so, yes, fortunately, some of the four cuckoos we have, three of them are of information needs, which means we don't see them a whole lot, okay? And one of these, of the information needs, has been observed twice since 2018, and two have had no sightings since 2018. So they could well be extinct or what's called extirpated, which means they still exist somewhere, but not where they used to be, okay? So... This is um, species of greatest need, lower declining populations, could be listed as threatened or endangered. Threats, lower in abundance, currently not rare. This is the Bombus teric- either terricola or terricola. I asked officially which is how it's supposed to be said, and the experts disagreed on which way <laughs> to say it. I like terricola, I think it rolls a little more. Um, anyways, it's the yellow banded bumblebee, and this is a female. It's not the greatest picture, but if you could get a little closer, see if she actually has a fringe of yellow hair on the back end of her abdomen, which helps you know that that's a female. Okay, go ahead. And then sufficient inf- not sufficient information are bees that we're trying to get more information so the DNR can determine how to manage habitat for them and care for them. And these are all the cuckoo bees. And this is one of the cuckoo bees that is rarely seen. This is Bombus flavidus, the fern, fernald cuckoo. Cuckoo, the cuckoo. This is a female, and this photo was by Ryan Brady, and it was published on B3. By the way, any photo not credited is my photo. Okay? All right. There are kind of geographic orientations for the bees in Wisconsin. The first picture is the common eastern bee, Bombus impatiens, which is everywhere. And this is my favorite bee. They're the first ones out and the last ones to go. They also are extremely good at pollinating tomatoes because tomatoes lock onto their pollen and they have to be buzz pollinated. The bee actually shakes the flower. And, and so they are sometimes used agriculturally for field, you know, areas growing a lot of tomatoes. The one on the bottom is the black and gold bee or a commas bee, and it is a southern bee. The one on the far end, the tricolored, is bee trinarius, and that is a northern bee. So you can sometimes see this pattern. We'll talk about the beach and areas more at the end of the show. Go ahead. And this is phenology. Phenology is the timing of events in natural circumstances. It usually applies to weather or natural plants or animals. And the first one shows you an early bumblebee. You can see, I did have a pointer, but it doesn't work. So it like totally doesn't show. But you can see the arc here kind of peters out at the far end. So this bee comes out in April. The blue ones are the queens, the dark blue ones are the workers, and the red ones are when the males show up. 
The middle is the impatience bee we talked about a minute ago. It is out the whole season, and you can see it's also very common. And the far bee is a cuckoo bee. Now, this cuckoo bee doesn't show up for a while because it has to wait for these other bees to make their nest so it can go rob them. Yeah. Yes, I know. I have a question yes. about that, that chart. Yeah. Um, it shows that the male bees coming out later, so how do the um, female bees get fertilized? If Good question. Yeah, and it, we're going to go through a whole lot of things, but I'll answer it now, but we'll show some more about it. There are three kinds of bees. There are queens, workers, and males. There are also the bees that are going to be next year's queens, which are called gynes. Okay? And they're called gynes because they haven't had a family yet, so they can't be the queen. Um, what happens is the queen bee starts, they have workers, and toward the end of the life of her nest, things change in the nest so that the fertilized eggs are not turning into worker bees. They're turning into either um, queens for next year or the males, which are the unfertilized eggs she lays. So at the end of the season, we get next year's queens coming out. This year's queen and all her workers die off. We get next year's queen and the males to fertilize her. So it's next year's queen that comes out at the end. Yeah, so gets are they, are, is the queen lay her right. eggs? That's what I just um, saw. How long does she, you know, between when it, when the queen is fertilized or, you know, when the queen is um, becomes pregnant? <laughs> okay. She gets pregnant in fall when she comes out in spring. Okay, that's what I said. Yep, so the eggs sleep with her over the winter. Okay. And she actually it's, um, overwinters underground or under leaf litter or something like that. And when she comes, um, they actually change something in their body so it's like alcohol and it's like antifreeze for them. So they can oh. freeze down on the ground. And then in spring when it warms up, they come out, wow. find, their, find themselves a nest. They don't use last year's nest. Mm -hmm. and, and then because she's already pregnant, she can lay her eggs. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, you, <coughs> Yes, question? From what I learned years ago, whether it was correct, is there one queen bee per nest? Yes. Okay. Unless she gets cannibalized by the um, cuckoo bees, in which case she may be killed or kind of off to the side or, or whatever. And then the cuckoo bees have her, child, her daughters, which are the female workers, our daughters, um, will um, take over and raise the cuckoo bee babies. And the cuckoo bee babies are only queens or males. They don't have workers. So that's why they need to go find some and recruit them. <laughs> wow, it's out. <laughs> that's cuckoo. <laughs> it is, it is cuckoo. Excuse me. And in fact, they're in a different species. Um, they're not, I, I can't remember the exact name, but they're not under Bombus, the cuckoo bees. Okay, what I'm passing around now is Three dead bees. I did not kill them. Um, when they get to the end of their life, they basically just fall dead wherever they are. And not this year, but last year, um, well, it's 2021, there were a lot of dead bees laying around, so I picked them up. So I just, you can look at them close up, take a look at them. Um, I actually found a couple ants hauling one away, and I let them keep oh. it. I figured free, free protein for them, so why not? But legally, I could ki kill any bee except for a rusty patch. Um, because it's federally endangered, I cannot. So when we have these breaks in between, we'll, we'll pass something around. Okay. So... Now we're going to talk about how we gather the photographic evidence of the components of, oops, are we ahead of one? Well, from the picture. Oh, it says part two. Oh, okay, I have a different thing here. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, I think I stuck in one before then. Okay, so the components of a B3 observation, what do I need to report? I need to tell them the date of when I got my B and where I got it. I need to be specific enough to tell them I got it in the backyard under the tree. Okay? I, they actually give me a little map to put a little pinpoint and say, here's where I found it. Um, generally, they're not going to worry about that unless I have a rare bee. If I would probably write in and say that I have a rusty patch nest, they might want to come out and look. Okay? And that's why they need to know it. For the most part, it's irrelevant or, or it, they know what county it goes in then. Okay? Um, I need to tell them what species it is and I need to prove that with a photograph. I need to tell them the sex. Again, prove it with a photograph. I need to tell them, if I can, the flower they're visiting. 
I can give them three to five photos, although occasionally one or two will do. And I give them any notes I want about the particular sighting. Now, if I'm 100% sure that I know this is this bee, I'm going to just send it in and say, here you go. But there's also an option for to send in an unknown bombus. In other words, I think it's a bumblebee, but I don't know what it is. Um, then they will try to identify it for you. Okay. All right. So, okay, they flipped. That's what happens. Oh, got it. Okay, so here we go. The evidence is to prove the species and the sex, and it's based on bee anatomy. So in order to take pictures that captures what you need to see, you need to understand a little bit of bee anatomy. And here's where it could get too technical. If it is, just tell me to move on, okay? All right, go ahead. Okay, so here's the bumblebee. Like any insect, it has three parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And the thorax is where everything gets attached. It's like having a ball and everything stuck onto it. Okay? So it has a face, it has a cheek, believe it or not, they call it a cheek. And how long the face is, is relevant. And it has a vertex. Back here, it's kind of like bangs. If you were this way and your hair came out of here, you'd have bangs back here. And the color of the vertex can be very useful in identifying not only a species, but its sex. Often the color of the vertex is different from male to female in the same species. And so every body part has features used to identify the species. Okay. The abdomen is the largest part of the bee, and there are six parts for a female, and there are seven for a male. So typically your male bee looks a little bigger than your female bee as far as, and it tends to be shaped a little more um, oblong. Um, so these parts are called turga. And when I report a B, if I'm going to be technical about it because I don't know what it is, I'm going to say T1 and 2 are yellow, T3 is black, T4 or 5 are, are orange, and T6 is black. Also, if it's a female B, which this one would be, you notice that T6 on the bottom there is really little. A little pointed butt is a female B. A rounded area with a seventh turga is a male B. Okay? So the thorax is the central part and everything attaches to it. The color of it is important in identifying the species, the pattern. Like we talked before about the bee having the Batman symbol in the middle, that is very characteristic of de deciding what kind of bee you have. And the black markings are, are the usual, if it's, it's either yellow or black. Go ahead. Okay. So this is the brown belted with, we're talking about the head. and Kind of ignore that picture over there. It's kind of more technical than I'd like it to be. But bumblebees have five eyes. They have the two big eyes, and they have three little eyes, as if I, if you were a bumblebee, they'd be right here on your head. Yeah. And they are mostly used for light sensitivity. The big bees, the big eyes are compound eyes, like you would think about when you think about insects. But these are used for, for light. Okay? The bumblebee species are identified using multiple different characteristics. Males and females of the same species may not look anything alike. Uh, thorax and abdomen markings together can be so unique, the species is easy to identify, or they can be so similar to others that it's just about impossible. The number of criteria you need to make a positive identification depends on how similar the bee is to other ones. Okay. How are bee bumblebees identified? Well, I'm gonna pass these out now because it's relevant. These are field guides. And I put plastic on them because I take them out in the field. And on each side is a picture of a characteristic bee of that species. There's a side for males and there's a side for females. Okay? This is the one that was given to us by B3. It's not my favorite. The reason it's not my favorite is because the Minnesota one's a lot nicer. Oh. <laughs> They give you a lot more information. I cannot find any reason that those bees on the Wisconsin one are in the order they are. And that doesn't help me. The Minnesota one's kind of clever. The Minnesota one says, if Turga 1 is yellow completely and Turga 2 is not, this, you've got one of these bees. If Turga 2 is yellow, if both are yellow, then you have the, one of these bees. And I thought, well, oh, that, yeah, that, that's a whole lot. makes more sense. Now, the only problem with the Minnesota one is that some of our bees aren't on there and some of their bees are on here. But you gotta keep in mind that the state lines are not 
something that bumblebees see. <laughs> and so we have some Minnesota bees creeping in over the Mississippi. We have some Illinois bees coming across. And until we see a female or a, a queen, they don't consider it to be officially in the state because if you have a male, he's just out looking for a good time. And so if he might cross the state line and it doesn't mean the bee's there, it just means he's on the loose. Okay, so here's the field guide from the top of one of the, uh, the one for Wisconsin, from the B3. And you can see the different patterns, the different colors. Um, the first bee on here, <laughs> the Rufus Inctus, yes, my nemesis. Um, it's a variable color, the color patterns are so variable that even though it's called the red-belted bee, a lot of them don't have any red. Yeah. The most common one has T1 and T2 yellow. Okay. Some of them can be very red, they can be orange, they can be any pattern they want. So they are very, very difficult. I finally learned after five years that the big deal is the big patch on the, on the thorax. The shape of it, the kind of roundedness, the largeness of it is characteristic. So from now on, I'm gonna, every time I send a bee saying, oh, I think it's this, or I don't know, it comes back Rufus Sanctus. And I'm like, I'm tired of red-belted bees. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so this is an example. Here on the left is a queen, or is a, a rusty patch bee. Interestingly, queen rusty patched bees do not have a rusty patch. Oh, gee. The one in the middle is a female, has a very dark rusty patch, almost to a brown or a brick red. The one on the right is very orangey and a lot less. Now, if you see the one on the right, it's a little hard. This is where my pointer would have come in handy. You can see she has a big glob of pollen right there. Yep. And if you see a bee with pollen, you have a female. Oh. No question, you have a female, okay? So did, were you able to kind of tell how that pattern matched on there? Okay, so see, see the, the shape, the T, they call this the thumbtack, marking on the abdomen, or on the thorax, rather. T1 and T2 are yellow with that central rusty patch. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, this one, um, easy to identify species. The male and female look a lot alike, and there's not a lot of variety in that bee for their color. So here's a female, here's a male, you can see there's a little difference in color. This one's a little orangey, this one's a little brown, but do you see that half moon there? Okay, that's the characteristic of this bee and the very small dot in the center of the, the thorax, okay? Go ahead. So, here you go. You have, it, it, I have had two people do this. They thought this was horribly hard. So, I apologize if you think this is horribly hard because you're not experienced with it. To me, I, I'm like, oh, that's so easy. Um, okay, so you've got three different bees on your field guide and you get the, a bee and you, you take these pictures. What bee do you think you have? And what are you looking at that makes you think that? I think it's the one in the middle. That's what I think. You're right. This is a brown yeah. belted because right. even though it's a little orange, they have a brown belt. Right. Now, what's even trickier is sometimes that brown belt is yellow. But the shape of it and the placement of it does not occur on any other bee we have. So it's still usually that. And it, the fact that that little dot on the thorax is usually very small. Very good. Yeah. Okay, one more. Okay, what about this one? Now, I'm, that picture on the right is crappy, yes. But I've used it to make a point. That picture is enough to identify this bee, to help identify this bee. It's clear enough with the characteristics that it can Definitely be used. Definitely the one on the right. <laughs> Definitely is the, yes. that's correct. Okay, very good. You can all now go out and start, start working for B3. Very good, okay, next one. Okay, now comes issues. There's morphs, okay? Here in the audience, we have morphs. You have brown hair, or red hair, or yellow hair, or gray hair. Each of those is a person morph. Okay, so the bees do that too, they make changes. Okay, there's your normal male pattern on the top with the two dots that you just saw for the, uh, the this is, I didn't say that, this is the two-spotted bee. I found this bee this year, down on the bottom here, that's all yellow, and sent it in, it's an unknown bombus, and it came back as a bombus um, brown-belted bee. I'm like, okay, sure. And then on the far side, there's one with extra yellow layers on it. And I sent that one in, I said, what is this? And it's a brown-belted. So the morphs happen for two reasons, just genetic variation. But at the end of the year, we see more morphs because the feeding can get less um, 
less good for them if they start running out of, it, out of food or stuff. And a lot of color variations happen, and they actually have, happen when they're being raised in, in the nest. Okay, thank you. So, so the females are the only one that collect pollen, is that? That is correct. Oh, okay. Yep. Why? Yeah. Why? Because, <laughs> well, it's just the way, yeah, okay. It, it's just the way it is with, yeah. a, with, a, with a lot of insects, yes. The females do all the work. Yes. And, the, and except for the queen, she has to raise the first batch, then she gets pampered and gets to lay around laying eggs all day. So what, what's the, why would the male be out there on a flower that, I mean, what would he be doing? Looking, looking for females. Yeah. Oh, is that I, all they do? <laughs> that is basically, yes, that is all they do. They are the only, I mean, we do have a male, a couple of males here, so I don't want to offend anybody, but yes, they are, in fact, they do so little that once they're mature, they get kicked out of the nest oh, wow. and, not, and not allowed back in. So they have no place to go, and in the fall, you will see them at night hanging around plants and hanging under plants, and we laugh because we have a, a lot of them in the back of one of our pollinator gardens that's under our our living room window and we say well there's the bachelor party <laughs> and, and so but basically yes and a lot of the bees you see at the very end of the year the november bees are the males and you know they they really have no purpose once the females are queens are bred but that's their that's the their use they just can't live without those yep. females. Pardon? and then they die yeah, they die. All the bumble all the bumblebees <laughs> die except for the queens for next year. So yep, that's okay. Um, yep, everybody else dies. Interesting. Yes. Whereas the honeybees, they all try to sustain through the year. That's why they make so much honey. Now, bumblebees do make honey, but it's little bitty pieces, I'll show you a picture at the end, in little honey pots for raising their young. Okay. Normally they feed pollen because pollen has a lot of nutrient nutrients in it, in particular protein. And there's various levels of protein and other things in, um, in the various pollens from different plants. So think of it as taking vitamin supplements. You get a little something different here, a little something different there. And depending on <clears throat> what's around, for example, they, they talk about leaving the dandelions for the bees. Well, dandelion pollen is not high class or high quality. And bumblebees will not use dandelion pollen if they have an alternative. If they're desperate, yes, they use it. Okay. Bumblebees, um, the females and the males, will nectar for themselves. That's their food. Okay. But the pollen is for the kids. Okay, so these are some a species with a different male-female pattern. Here we have the um, American bumblebee, also known as Pennsylvanicus. And this is the male to the lower and the female up. He's very long and skinny. She's a little rounder. Um, over on the other side, we have the lemon cuckoo bees. This is one that's an invasive on other bees. The top is a female, which the, she has uh, little yellow patches on the outside. And the male is completely different. He has turgus one, two, three are yellow. She has yeah. no turgus. So this, this makes it harder to identify until you learn these things because there are multiple bees that have turgus one, two, and three yellow. Some are female, some are male, a totally different species. This male tends to be kind of small. Okay. Okay, so difficult to distinguish bees. Yes, ma'am. On the cuckoos, um, if they're not native, if they're invasive, where are they, where's their native? Good question. Invasives can be natives. They are native. Oh, they are. They are native, yes. Yes. Any plant or animal that's out of control, and there's, I guess maybe I used the wrong word saying invasive, they're more predatory. Uh -huh. But they are, they are a native bee. Thank you for asking. <coughs> yes, ma'am. And do um, bees stay in like, oh, maybe a 50 yard, 50 mile radius, or, or you know, do they uh, stay in one nest area? Or? Um, are you referring to as their nest or as their territory? Their territory. Um, they would not go that far. Okay, but they, but they do can do a couple in a miles. Area. Yeah, they do. Uh, okay. And unlike unlike the honeybees, they do not do waggle dances or anything. They're kind of on their own. They find their places to go. But um, I think we see, for example, we generally see certain bees in our yard. Um, we see the rusty patch. We have, except for this year, seen what's called the yellow bee, which is Bombus fervidus. I think that if you have something they like and they come and visit, they're more inclined to overwinter in that area and then maybe create a new nest in that area the next year. So I, that's how I think it works. But anyways, here, this represents four different species of bees in both male and female. 
Now, how would you like to identify those? Okay, this is why you need a back and a face and yeah. the side because they're all very similar. Yeah. And the two that are the same are two and three. And I had notes on this and I didn't print them. Um, I believe those are, yeah, those are Bombus fervidus. Okay, so male is here, female is there. Yeah. This is a northern, um, northern amber bee. Uh, that one right over there is probably, that's probably a Pennsylvanicus. The one down over there all the way is probably a Rufus Inctus, probably. So, I mean, do you want that in English? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. Northern Boreal, uh, yellow bee, uh, yellow band, no, not yellow banded, American bee, and red belted. Are there a, a bee that's more angry would be more likely to sting you? Oh, or? yes. Oh, that's oh, yes. a good question. It's a very good question. In general, they nest in the ground, not necessarily, you know, they're not going to be on the eaves of your house. They don't make a hanging nest, they're a ground, ground tree. But there are some that will um, go in garages. The guy that we see up here, it's my lead-in guy, that species is nastier, the grizz, grizzies, uh, the brown belteds. They're more aggressive defenders of their nest. Um, uh, at the very end of the show, we're going to show you a um, two-spotted nest that my neighbor at, inadvertently opened up and the, the nest was here and my camera was here they were coming and going and nobody bothered us okay the ones that scare me the most are the um, black and gold bee we'll see some pictures they're as big as my thumb okay and the, the first year I did this they only come around when I have uh, the red bee bomb out Monarda out because it's a bigger flower they're a bigger bee and bees, bees love this flower so the first year I was doing this my bee bomb be over there and I'd be over here taking pictures and before she'd leave she'd come and buzz me and I'm not real fond of being buzzed by a bee that's this yeah. big you know and there's a place where uh, Rotary Gardens has this down kind of near um, near the pagoda they have an area of this red bee bomb and it's big and high and there it's on a berm about this wide and there'll be 40 of them there Ooh. and you know so I just I, I photograph from a little more distance away the other thing about Bumblebees, is, the males don't have stingers, the females and queens do, and unlike honeybees, they can sting you as much as they want. Oh, Yes. The other good thing is that bumblebee nests are, in general, I think we mentioned, generally smaller than in, in population. So you might, you know, not get hurt as bad or get away sooner because there will be fewer bees to chase you around. Yes, ma'am. So, um, like you were saying, that the bees came and buzzed you and that one type. So if there are several of them in a, like you're saying, Rotary Gardens, would they be aggressive towards each, each other? No, they're not. Okay. Oh. They're, they're typically very much, and bees of opposite species are not typically aggressive toward each other. They'll share a flower or whatever. Okay. But no, no, they're typically not that so, I've seen. So they're only aggressive to what they feel might be a threat? To, usually okay. to their nest, very okay. much so, yeah. And also, for whatever reason, Bees don't like dark colors. Oh. Don't wear red if you're going to go out looking for bees. Don't wear black. Wear lighter colors and they'll, they'll be happier. Um, nobody's asked me yet, but somebody will. How many times have you been stung? No. Okay. Once. My very first year, the garden, you were in the garden. I was standing here taking pictures of you, and I got stung from behind. Oh. Behind my knee. I have no idea what got me. You know, I, I want to vote for yellow jacket because it was later in the year, but I'm like, you're kidding, right? <laughs> You know, so no, nasty, so yeah, yes, they are. Yeah. But but the bumblebees are really nice. I mean, they're on the flower, and I'm like, I want that a little closer. and move the flower, and they, they you know, they have, other than the one that used to come buzz me, I've never been bothered by any of them. They're very mild mannered for the most part. Although again, defending the nest is, might be a different situation. Okay, all right. So here's the, I don't know if they call them sexes, genders. Some people call them casts. I don't know. You got your queen, lays the eggs. Starts the nest, starts the whole thing, overwinters. You got your male, fertilizes things and eats. Uh, you got the worker, stuck with everything else in between. Okay? Helps raise the young, gathers the pollen, literally drops dead when they wear out. Okay? Maintains the hive, raises the young. Go ahead. Okay? So this is the common eastern bee that you'll see most 
around here. And the queen is the largest. Notice the little bipple at the bottom. That's her sixth turga. That means it's a girl. And you notice how she's kind of wide. She looks to me like a rounded rectangle. And they are really fat. And, and they tend to, when you see them, they tend to be very neat and clean because they're new. And the one in the middle is a male. You notice he's kind of elongated. Look how fuzzy he is. Male bees tend to be really fuzzy. And along the sides of the abdomen, it's blurred out a little with the background, but he has a lot of hair. And then on the far end is the worker, the female, which could be the smallest of the bees. Okay. Also, I'd like to, oops, I'm sorry, can we go back that one? And then we have a little sex here. Okay, on the, on, on the far end, where you see the female bee, do you see how there's an area that's kind of a black line and then there's kind of that area that's a little brownish? They refer to that as an indistinct marking on the thorax. As this bee ages, the hair in that area will fall out. And the same bee in a month or two will have an entirely black area there. Go ahead. OK, so gynes and drones. Drones are the males. The gyne is the female next year. So here's the female for next year. Note what's called the corbicula. This is her pollen carrying basket on the hind leg. And there's this, the drone. You can count his seven, sec, his seven turgas very clearly here. There's one yellow one, and then one, two, three, four, five, six yeah. black ones. Okay. Notice the size difference. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So this is the female anatomy. Again, here's the corbicula. This is your um, black and gold bee, the one I was talking about, being kind of big, and she's on a minority there. So like I said, she's the size of my thumb at least, okay, and about that, that big around. Then we have the, the little button-like turga as well, and then we have four different females with pollen of different colors. So pollen color depends on the plant. When I went up to Madison last year at the um, Arboretum, there were a couple of like major bee experts leading this program, and they're like, oh, yeah, they must be harvesting the pollen from such and such a plant. I'm like, you can tell that by the color? Whoa, okay, not me. Okay, <laughs> next. Okay, so here's the male anatomy. They are hairier than females. They have hair around their abdomen, and their armpits on the back of their legs. Um, they also have the seven turga. Um, the male bumblebees can have the enlarged face, they have more hair on their face, and they have a rounded abdomen. Thank you. All right, so let's see, let's pass out a couple of bumblebee books. Okay, this bumblebee book is used, shows different patterns of um, what's on the um, abdomens and on the thorax. And if, you, um, it, it doesn't, if you're looking for a particular bee, this book does not have an index, so I made my own on the inside front page. But what it does is it will show you some pictures, when they're, what their phenology is, when they're expected to be around, and then it will give you pictures of what color patterns you might find. Mm -hmm. If you want to find the trip, you want to go to page 38 and look at the, roof, the red belted bee and see all the different color patterns. Okay. So this book I use a lot for the color patterns when I have questions, and it's fairly straightforward. This book is the Harry Tech one, saying, oh, and they have a little hook on the back end of this and that leg, and I'm like, well, I'll pass. But I did use this book to identify um, one bee that I'll show you later, um, and I was able to identify the bee by the hair on his legs, <laughs> because he had hairy legs. Oh. When you take a picture, if you don't know what it is, and then when you go back, then you might cross, um, investigate to see what that's that's cor is. That's correct. Generally, you can't imagine they're moving, and they're yeah. trying to figure out what it is. <laughs> um, actually, there are, there are some that you will know right away, because you see them so much. Yeah, right. and, and after five years, I can say, that's an impatience, oh, or, right. or that's a red belted. You know, and there's some you don't know, especially when you hit a morph, or you hit a bee species that you've never seen before. But um, I, I wish I did a better job of um, identifying as I photograph. But with the camera I use, I need another person, which I've never been able to recruit. And I mean, it's, it's a crap job, you know, it doesn't pay well. And uh, <laughs> um, but uh, so what, what happens is I do two things to try to take care of the pictures. If I'm photographing somewhere other than my home, I take a picture of where I'm at. So I'm like, OK, number one, here's a different place. I'm at a different place. The other thing is, as I get from B1 to B2, I take a picture of something that has no B in. So now when I get done, and I have this whole list of pictures, which I bring up, and they're all over the screen, um, you know, I see where I was. I see where I have a different bee. You know, if I go to the Arboretum and I take 10 bees, I have a picture of the Arboretum, first bee, something that's not a bee. If I think it is a queen bee, I photograph the sky. 
and I photograph like a tree up in the sky, it's because she's bigger and she's up there, you know. And so then you go through and try to pick some pictures. Well, we're going to see a, a row of eight pictures later that could be a part of me trying to identify a bee. This is neat. So when you take pictures, are you looking for something different? Because obviously you've got every year and every season, and why would you have 500 pictures of the, the same of brown belt? That's something I do. She's got one. Okay, um, that's a good question. When I first started doing it, I would go out every day and take pictures and send them in. After two years, they told us, if you do the same place over and over, once a week is fine. <laughs> Which was great, because not only did it save them work, but it saved me work. Um, and so typically what I'm doing is I'm documenting the same guys. And at, through the season, different bees are going to show up. All of a sudden, I'm going to see a male. I'm going to see a queen. I'm going to see a different species. And so they want you to, to record anything you routinely see, anything you've seen for the first time, anything that you've seen for the first time for that sex, um, and or any, anything new. So it's a matter of all of the above. Yeah. So the person that has a hive, this isn't the type of bee that's in the hive? So. That's correct. This okay. is not the type of bee that's in the hive. Okay. You can put them in the hive, you wouldn't get any honey. Okay. And they wouldn't want to be in there. So they're underground. All they pretty much live underground. They'll be under logs. We had one last year try to start a, a nest. She actually succeeded because at one point I saw three bees go in. We have a plastic box, big box, that we throw sticks in that fall in the yard until we get enough that we take them to the dump. And last year, a, a, another two-spotted bee started a nest in there. But the, there's not much in the way of drainage holes. And so one of two things happened in that nest. It either, you couldn't see it, first of all, for the sticks, but one time I kicked the box just to see if anything came out. And there were, a couple of bees came out, so I knew that there was a nest in there. But um, it either got too much water after heavy rain and didn't drain and they drowned, or I thought I saw a chipmunk go in there and the chipmunk could have eaten them. Oh. Bees have a tough time. There's a lot of things, you know, that, that are harassing, that, r harassing them and seeing them as food. Okay. I know in my uh, second grade class, the teacher every year got a bee hive for the room and had a hole in the wood, and they came and go, and we could watch them. But, but she had a window to the outside. These yes. were not in the classroom. True. Gotcha. Well, okay. But it, the whole thing was in the classroom. Really? You could see. And then she put a space, it had a spacer in there, and then it had a hole that they came. But yeah. it was very interesting. It, it is, very, I mean, very much so. Yeah. They're basically pollinators. Is there any other special purpose? for their development of that? No, they are pollinators, you're right. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, just a second. If any of you are <coughs> interested in pollinator gardens, <coughs> yes. I am doing a program up in two weeks at Ulrich on a Sunday. Oh. And it goes through pollinators. And the thing is, plants need to, are male and female, or let me freeze that. Plants, most plants have both male and female parts. And unfortunately, most of them cannot f fertilize themselves. They also can't walk around and go find the opposite sex. So they need somebody to do the work for them. That's what the pollinators are. And they pick up the pollen from um, the male part of the plant while they're getting some nectar or pollen you know, for their babies, whatever. And then they fly to another plant. And because they're full of that pollen, it drops off to the next plant, uh, plant and they can you know, they do the fertilization for the plants. And that's why we're, they're so important, because 70 to 95 percent of our foodstuffs are done by bees. I mean, do you want to go fertilize the tomatoes in your garden? You know, do you want to fertilize all the coffee beans for your coffee, your pot of coffee in the morning? You know, no. So we really depend on them. So, but that's basically what, what they do. And of course, they raise their young. So, yes, ma'am. What about that invasive bee that was coming in? The, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, you mean the kill, kind of killer bee thing? Or? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're mostly attacking the uh, bumblebees. Oh. They're more of a bumblebee threat, I think. Mm. I'm sorry, I mean honeybees. The honeybees, the honeybees oh. yeah. yeah. If they went after the bumblebees, they wouldn't get much. Where yeah. are they now located? I don't know. I, I don't follow them. But yeah, I'm waiting till they tell me they're in my yard. 
<laughs> or close by. Um, I don't know if this was asked, maybe I'll space it out, but what do the bumblebee nests look like underground? You'll see one later. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is, where am I? And it's the beginning of part three. Part three. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we're going to talk about doing the actual photography a little bit. Okay, because again, you're an art group and I had to do something to bring the art into it, right? <laughs> okay, so what do you, what do you want to use? Do you want to use single lens reflex or the cell phone? Okay, the single lens reflex is the big hairy camera you saw in the pictures, greater flexibility for shots, adjustable ISO and shutter speed, program options, less shake due to the weight, but it's heavy with two-handed operation, it's expensive, and you have more technical complexity. Okay. The cell phone is convenient, inexpensive, lightweight. You can, some people with bigger hands than mine can use it. One hand can take pictures. Um, it's easy to carry, easier to take notes or make comments maybe if you can talk to it or do something in your email. Um, it's harder to steady it, and it has a more limited technology, but I know that's changing, and I am obsolete on cell phone cameras, so I say that with question marks. Um, and it's be but it's best for close-ups. So if you've got a bee and your flower's right here and the bee's not too busy and there's not a whole lot of other stuff around where it's going to go somewhere else, it's great, great there, you know. But um, I'll show you my, my garden in just, that's, that's my pollinator garden. Now, it's not very good for me to go in and wade through that and try to take pictures. So I use my long lens from here, I, because from here I can take the picture of a bee or a butterfly on this uh, milkweed in the foreground and something else of, on the pollinate on the uh, monarda, the red monarda, or something way back there on what looks like Joe Pie weed. Huh, don't know that I had Joe Pie weed in that part. Oh well, <laughs> I never know. Did your, I mean, your love for the bees start with your, you've already met, had a love for flowers or, you know, in I, your yard or? Good question. For, for 30 years, 30 years, I think we've been there, maybe a little, maybe let's say 25 years, my pollinator garden was very much focused for monarch butterflies. Oh, okay. I've, ta I've tagged monarch butterflies and we used to raise them in the house. But it's a lot of work to keep them sanitary. And your house smells like processed milkweed which is not a oh. bad smell, it's not a bathroom smell, but it's yeah. a very, it, it is a distinctive smell, and it is literally, they're in a cage making poops. And so you do have to take care of that, and it, it just got to be more work. Once my kids left home, it was more work than I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and then I ran into this bumblebee thing, and so now I've switched kind of into more of a bee and monarch butterfly situation. Also, the last couple of years, Probably the last year was really, last two years have been bad for monarchs. Not a lot of them. And I know, I, I paid for 300 tags last year, I used 125. Yeah. And, and the, the, the year before that though, we had a really late heavy migration. And it was a stellar year, probably one of the best in my life. Mm -hmm. So that, it makes a difference. But yeah, so, so I try to do a little bit more of everything now. I'm a little more native plant oriented. But okay, so here we go. Getting the pictures. You're looking for a face and head, a side or a back, and there are many challenges that influence the taking of that. This is a tricolor bumblebee female. She does have a hairy face, but that's not because she's a male, but just the color of their face. They do have hair on their faces. Go ahead. Okay, so let's talk about the head and face view. This is the most important shot because when you're gut, um, when you're stuck between a couple of species, the features here can make a difference. So it's usually can be helpful whether it's taken from, this one's kind of taken from the back, this one's kind of taken from the side. This one to the right is a fervidus, the yellow bumblebee, and you can see how long the face is. In the, in the, techno, or in the vernacular, we call that horsey face. So you say, this is a horsey face, horsey face bee. Okay, so this is the common eastern bumblebee. They refer to this face as being square because it is pretty much a square little face. You can't totally see that, but you can kind of get the idea that that's the case. Okay, okay. so talk about what we see on the face. Well, you have enlarged eyes here for spotting females on this male brown-belted, you have or orange facial hair, the color's a little off. The antenna, and I want to address this, because this when I realized this was a shock to me. The antenna don't come out of the top of the head. No. They come out of the middle of the face. Yeah. They also move around. Mm. Right? And I would never talk about this. You can kind of, or ask anybody to do anything with this, but you can kind of see on the right um, 
antenna. Can you see kind of little sections? Yeah. Males have 14, females have 13. Oh, I have never counted them, okay? Oh. I mean, this is the kind of thing that that thick book goes into. And, oh, and I'm like, you know, if that's what's going to identify the bee, I'm sending it as an unknown bombus, and you can worry about it. Okay? This one has a short face. You can see that the eyes pretty much come down to the, the eyes. Now, here I was going to go use my pointer. See these little biffles right here? Those are the three other eyes, the, the oh, ones that okay. deal with the light, called ocelli. Like I said, they'd be right, right here on us. Okay. And what, why are they adjusting the, or seeing the light for? It, it helps more with orientation of daytime and, and that kind of thing. Some other bees it does a little more, or other insects, but it's kind of part of the insect thing. Yeah. Okay. Here's a side view. Um, the side view might be the easiest because the bees naturally tend to kind of hang on the flowers in some way. And you could take it from the left side, or you could take it on the right side, depending on where you're oriented in the garden. Um, it's really important for the turga to be able to count the turga, to see the colors, to be able to see the ending. You can't see the ending of the bee on this one. But there's a lot of information in this picture. This is the yellow bumblebee. But the sex is unknown because I cannot see the legs to see if it has pollen, or if it has the wide pollen carrier, or if the back end has the little pointed tail. So while this would be a great side picture that I could use in combination with other pictures on its own, I could not identify this bee right. properly. Okay, the other one is the half black bumblebee male. They are really fuzz buzzes. <laughs> and they are not the fuzziest bee. There's one called Bombus perplexus that is hairier. I have not had the pleasure of seeing them. I keep sending them in suggesting it's a perplexus, and they keep sending it back saying, no, it's a vagans, the <laughs> half, half black bee. And that one we do know is a male. Then taking pictures of back view. This should be the easiest because the bee is often facing into the flower. Um, but sometimes it's not. If you have a flower like this and the bee's up here and you're my size, it's really hard to get above <laughs> that bee to look down and see the back. Okay. So this is the common eastern bumblebee. Again, that indistinct marking on the back is distinctive. Short face. On the right side is the rusty patch queen. You can see she has just a hint of a little orange, but that's more than most of them have. Questions? Identifying where the rusty patches were. Okay. All right. Really Challenges taking pictures of the bees. It's the weather. The wind may blow your foliage around. I have 60 pictures like this, and I couldn't oh. identify a single bee <laughs> because everything was just so blurred out. <laughs> on the right, the sun may cast shadows on the plants, making it hard to get good, clear pictures. This actually projected looks much better than it did on my computer screen, it, where the, back, the black part of the abdomen just disappeared into the background. Go ahead. Is there a reason that, that bees get so nasty in the fall? <laughs> oh, you're talking about wasps. Yes. Yeah. Oh. You're talking about the yellow jackets, yes. They are no longer raising their young, and some, some sort of chemical imbalance it, uh, occurs in them that they're see, seeking sweet stuff. So they come around anything we have that's sweet, like the apples that fell off the tree, or or um, your can of pop on, on the picnic bench. They're, they're basically, they're in a way they're suffering because they're just, you know, their whole normal scheme is gone and that's why they get ornery. Yeah, because yeah. I, re I remember at the art fair at the Tolman House every year, the, you know, the, the sweets, you know, and everything, there was always a lot. They're all crawling all over it. Whatever around that were. Yeah. Yeah, it's mostly yellow jackets. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, and, and yellow jackets tend to be ornery. Okay. Just uh, uh, that's their personality. Okay. Yeah, they're just you know even when they're nice, they're they're still on the ornery <laughs> side. Okay, so then one of the other problems is the plants. They stick their head in. Okay, yeah. here's a black and gold female bee, nice curricula right here, telling me it's a female, and uh, you know now I'm going to take a picture of her head. Now I may wait for her to back out. She might stick it right back in. She might go to the next flower and stick it in before I can do it. It's hard to time. The center one, the foliage can make it hard to get a picture. The bee disappears here into the flowers. On the far one, the bee is occluded because, oh, this bee, this was a 60 picture bee. We'll talk more about it later, but um, it's in a very small a mint plant that has small foliage, deep foliage, and a friend pointed her out to me, and for reasons I'll reveal later, she was a bee I really wanted to get decent pictures of. And I sat there and just stared at this foliage going like this 
while she was down into the plant about six inches, waiting for her to come up so I could get her pictures. Or the bees themselves cause problem. If there's a whole lot of bees out there of the same kind, how do you know the one that just moved over there is the one you were tracking? Yeah. You don't. Okay. You know, it may move out of focus like this guy did when the flower is still in focus. They can fly to another location before you can get all the so shots you want. Okay? And here's what they call curating. They refer to us as needing to curate our pictures. You can look through them, and now I just tried to pick some out. So I've got these eight pictures of the bee. I need to send in my best back, my best side, and my best head. So I may have 60 pictures, and I just basically start going through them. And if I find one that I think is really good, I'll stop. I'll edit it to the best I can, save it back with a name of the same, same number with like second or edited or something on it, so I know. So if I was looking through it, I'd say that's not a bad side picture. The second one in is an OK back picture. The third one down is lost in the foliage. I delete it. The fourth one down is the wings are covering the body. I delete it. This one it could be a decent head, head shot. I'm going to keep it. Uh, this one is, I think that's supposed to be a head shot too, but I don't know. I might dump it. Um, this one here is, uh, is an OK kind of 3 quarters shot, what I call 3 quarters. Shows some of the back, some of the abdomen, some of the head. And this one, unless I'm trying to I have a question on what sex this bee is, I would dump that because the abdomen doesn't tell me much of anything unless I'm trying to show the rounded or the pointed little back. And at this point, would I, okay, right here, uh, one, two, three, four, okay, this is a girl. There's a crabicula there. It's got six turga. I don't need that picture. Okay, so that's what I would do. Okay, so how do I then submit all this? Well, this is the um, B3 page. I can add a site or click the site I map. Go ahead. This will be quick. I map on my site. That's my house with an arrow pointing to my pollinator garden. That's where I saw it. I fill in additional information. Did somebody else see it? What kind of place is it? You know, where exactly was it located? Go ahead. Okay, then I tell you what species did it, was it, what sex was it, how many did I see, and was it, uh, what was it on? I put bee bomb. Now, I'm sure this um, identification, so I didn't write anything about the turgos or the face or anything. Okay. Then I submit some pictures. My pictures here, I chose to do four of them. And that is, those pictures are not Pennsylvania cats, by the way. Um, just, they just put pictures in there. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, then I submit it. And it winds up on my list of all the plants I did. Or all, all the, um, it tells me this is year 2020. What date did I see that be? Where did I see it? What did I see? When I submitted it, and when they said I was right. Questions, Era? Oh, okay. <laughs> How much time do you spend, like during the spring and you know during that season? <laughs> you know, they want us to track our time, and it's so small, for example, how much, in, in a way, how much time did I spend putting that in? 30 seconds. I don't want to count 30 seconds as, you know. How about, I mean, how, 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 how inside, you know? uh, just, just on the bee stuff? Taking <coughs> pictures of them and such. I don't know. I gave, I gave them some number. I think about it. I, I count how many lines do I have, which isn't Everyone is not a separate observation. I can report five bees as one observation. I'd say at least three, four hundred, more, I don't know, you know, because there's the time spent photographing, the time spent doing yes. your editing. Um, I have finally wised up in that I don't ha get haired up trying to identify a bee. The first couple of years, I'd spend an hour trying to go, is it this one or that one? I finally decided it's not worth my time to do that. Just send it in and say, I don't know, you know, let them do it, you know, so that, that's got easier. Yep. Okay. So the oh, conclusion, so, it's, it's one of my favorites. That's a rusty patch. And she is on, I don't know what that is, plant-wise. I should know that. Anyways, there are, what are the successes of B3? Well, 67 counties in Wisconsin out of 72 have been surveyed at, some, at least once by B3 participants. The rusty patch bees were found in 41 counties which is great. So Wisconsin is a stronghold for the rusty patch bee. In 2022, B3 volunteers observed rusty patch bees in Richland, Dunn, and Calumet counties for the first time. And researchers at UW Green Bay, along with B3 members, use B3 data to publish what flowers the rusty patch bumblebee uses most frequently. Okay, next. Wisconsin bumblebee observations the last three years. Okay, in April, 
No workers, makes sense, no nests. 228 queens and no males. In May, 142 female workers um, takes about, I've seen two to four, and, but more generally it's considered four-ish weeks from a nest to establish to workers being out and about. 784 queens, more are coming out, more species come a little later, no males. In June, 686 workers, 466 queens, 23 males. Some bees are starting to already wrap up by June. Um, in July, 2,697 2, workers, 115 queens, 802 males. Some of them are really wrapping up. Um, in August, 1,821 bees, wow. workers, 218 queens, 16, 16 males. Things are really starting to set up for next year. Notice the workers are down. Some, some of the nests are done. Okay. In September, 173 workers, 238 queens, 438 males. Uh, in October, we have 80 workers, 118 queens, 198 males. So you see the slew as the nests close. Those queens are getting set for next year. The males are hoping to get set for next year. And then everybody dies by the end of November. Mm -hmm. But the queen. Except the, que the guines. That have, yes, that's right. Yeah. And they're underground because you aren't seeing them. They go from 80 in October to 4 in November. They, they've found a place. Okay. That's cool. And that is just to put it into a, a bar chart here of uh, what are we seeing proportionately. And you can see how there's just about no males in June to basically almost all males in September and August. A heavy amount. Okay. All right. So this is my big coup last year. I've had two. This is number. This is one. Um, last year, a friend of mine across the street, my neighbor, said, "Hey, you know, I was sitting with my husband on the porch the other day, and I told him, see that big bee over there? That's a queen.' And he says, "How do you know that?" Well, Anne told me. So I walked over to chat with her, and she said, "Hey, this queen bee's hanging around here." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, show it to me." I'm like, "Oh my God, it's not one of the normals." And so it was in a a mint plant. Like I say, it was about so big, deep, little bitty flowers, hopping in and out. And I'm like. Seriously. So I waited 15 minutes to get a bunch of pictures, not great pictures. These are the best of them. Wow. And anyways, this is a northern bee in Rock County. And it's a queen. And it has the uh, Batman symbol. And she's been confirmed. First ever queen in, in five years. Wow. Seen in, of this species in the Rock County. Again, I mentioned that historically, they have come all the way down to our last row of counties, so even historically, this was out of range. Yeah. Now, the question is, both a neighbor and her neighbor have cottages up north. Right. Did she ride home? Oh. I don't know. Yeah. She's not going to hitchhike back. Yeah. So if she makes it through the winter, we may have Tenarius here in the, in the county. Yeah. Okay, next one. This is the first Pennsylvanicus male, um, American bee. Um, the first observation in B3 in 2020 was mine, and the um, also have seen the females. Um, and so this is him, and I identified him. You can't tell him really well, but I used that thick book because he's, you saw that picture. We had five bees all the same. I'm trying to figure out what this guy is. Yeah. So I looked, and right there, you see how hairy he is on the leg? Yeah. Yep, that's how I identified that bee. <laughs> and I was right. Yes, but it took a long time, yes. But anyway, so that was him. Okay, now the next one is I have video of a bumblebee hive. I have some stills. Can't figure out how to get the video into here. So if you want to watch it on my phone later, you can. Okay, but this is what you're going to see. My neighbor had um, inherited when he bought a, a new house, a new building, new, new house, inherited some raised beds made from timbers about this big and they decided to take it down because they didn't have the need for the raised beds and so as they were doing so they revealed this nest it wasn't unintentional but we'll show it to you okay so this is the bumblebee life cycle we talked about we started in the center the guy comes guy comes out in spring she's the one that fertilized last year's queen to be princess if you will Okay, so she builds herself a nest. She does queen behavior, uh, run around in circles, go across the ground, about this high off the ground, stops and digs into some little corners and things, and eventually she decides where she'd like to live. So she sets up, she raises the first worker, single mom, okay? Then, so there's not that many of them, just a couple. 
and she gathers the pollen for them and the nectar for herself and they use a little nectar for the babies to make a little honey and then those bees become her workers she basically stays in and lays eggs and so the bees you see mostly this time of year if you see a bee this time of year a bumblebee you got a queen okay within the next um, month you're going to see some queens of the later species and you'll see some workers from the earlier species you'll tell them by the size okay and then eventually you shouldn't see as many queens because they're going to stay in okay so late summer or fall the colony starts to produce guides for next year and drones and dies out and then the drones and queens mate and she hibernates and the whole thing starts again okay and here is Oops, there's something on there that shouldn't be on there. That's okay. Uh, first bumblebees are seen in spring. The queens for some species do not appear until summer. Female workies, workers of each species appear four to five weeks after the queens, and the male drones appear in midsummer. So if you see here, blue is queens. So the queens we see at the beginning, they're creating their nests. And we start to get an influx and a big high peak of the dark blue, which is the workers. Then we start to see some queens for the species that are dying out. And those are their guidance for next year, and the males. And you'll notice at the end the males are left. Okay, so this is a spotted bee nest in July, June of 2022. The first three pictures are from a 100 degree day. Go ahead. Okay, can you see two bees? Okay, from my perspective, it's not as good. Okay, this is the opening to the nest that was first discovered. And there, I don't know what the first bee's doing right now, if this guy's leaving or what, but they were actually fanning the hive. So when we have, go ahead, like that. Oh. Okay. And while I was watching, another bee came out. It was like there were a couple of friends, you know, came out and talked. Hey, how's it going on here? Sure is a hot one, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'll take over now. And these are females. These are workers. That's what they do. There's a tunnel back into there. Go ahead. And I do have a short clip of the fa actual fanning. And then you can see here, it, sort of see in the background, the shadow of the other bees up yeah. in the nest. Uh -huh. Okay, so what first happened is they opened this, hot, this part. Now, this is some of the little honey packets they make. They're laying on the ground because somebody tore the nest open. Some sort of an animal. Go ahead, next picture. And here you can see we have the queen right there, the big one, and then those are her workers. And now this nest is open like this. They did, the neighbors did put a um, piece of wire over it to try to get, keep things out, but it wasn't totally successful. Okay, next one. One question. Oh, sorry. Um, so are, are the workers always female? Yes. The workers are always female. Okay. And they, under normal circumstances, they do not breed. I'm not quite sure um, if, like, the queen gets killed by accident, if somebody can take over or not. I'm not yeah. sure about that. Okay, so here's another um, photo of inside the nest. You see it's kind of a concave little thing that they're hanging around in. Go ahead. Okay, now, you see these things in there that look like worms? Yeah. Those are not their larvae. Oh. This is a infestation of waxworms. It's a parasite. Oh. Okay, go ahead. And there's the queen oh. again in the front. Yeah, it's kind of gross. Oh. Okay, go ahead. And eventually this nest was destroyed June 30th by some sort of a night predator, like a raccoon or a possum or something. Okay, and then number five. So when you're standing around in the garden with your camera waiting for bees, you see some other pretty neat stuff. Mm -hmm. I have some nice pictures here I'd like to share with you of other things I've seen in my garden. Don't go there. <laughs> okay, go ahead. That's right. The arrow out of the way. Okay. okay, there's just a, a morph on a chive plant, a morph of a bee on a chive plant. Go ahead. This is a hummingbird. What a nice that's a that's a female uh, hummingbird. Oh. And this this I included is not the greatest picture, but I've never seen a hummingbird in a hollyhock. They're usually a little deeper, you know. And this flower is maybe about like so. So I was really surprised. Mm. And there's a hummer with their wings down, and that is um, Verbena bonariensis. Yeah. Does anybody ever grow it? Yeah, okay. Yep. Yep. Is that a milkweed? No. No. It's no. It's a verbena, and uh, it's an annual, and it self-sows madly. And rumor has it, once you have it, you never unhave it. Oh. 
but it, what's nice about it is you don't ever have to pay for it again. Oh. Um, and, and it transfers easily from where it's, you don't want it to be to where you do want it to be and, and takes oh. really well. Wow. Okay. And here's, I think this is like uh, kamikaze hummingbird. <laughs> yeah, this is my favorite. I, I love this one because of the chartreuse and the uh, purple because they're across from each other on the, hunt, yeah. on the color wheel. And they really just pop on this one. Okay, wow. there's a bee in a pansy. And you notice the stripes on the pansies? It's not just decoration. That tells the bee where to aim. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And there's actually some flowers that have, bees can see differently than us. They can see ultraviolet. There are flowers with arrows on them to the middle in ultraviolet oh light. Yep. This is a silver streak butterfly, and there's a side view of it. And look at the eye. It looks like it's caked up, doesn't it? Kind of neat. Yeah. Um, this is a female swallowtail laying eggs on dill. This is a, I believe it's a white something or other. Uh, it's a moth. Yeah, what, let's see. I can't think of a kind. Yeah. Nope, it's not a hummingbird moth. No, nope. sphinx moth. Sphinx moth. Well, maybe white lined sphinx moth. There's more than one yes. kind. And there it is. With it, you can see its yeah. mouth. This is a. This, it's a salvia plant. Look at where the salvia plants has their um, oh. their ovary. Then when the bee, or uh, I guess it would be with a bee, crawls in, it's going to scrape across their back oh. and pick up the pollen that's on the back of the bee. There's a bee in a closing morning glory flower. There is a golden-winged dragonfly. You, it's not a pollinator. It eats pollinators, so that's kind of a no-no. But your garden, a pollinator garden is going to attract not just your pollinators. It's going to attract the things that feed on your pollinators as well. Yeah. And another picture of the golden wing. We'd never seen those before. We were flabbergasted. They're so pretty. What did you shoot all these with? I'm sorry. Uh, 250 um, millimeter single-lens reflex uh, autofocus. Yep. Um, Female monarch butterfly, on mo butterfly, uh, that's good. The oh. big black wasp, Ooh. just the nicest things. Very, very nice creatures. Oh. Never bothers you. Oh. And when the blue catch it, the light catches it, mm. it, the blue. It's gorgeous. Oh. And it's about like this. Oh, that's beautiful. This is a uh, morning swallowtail, and this took first place about five years oh. ago at the Walworth County Fair in the Insect Division. Oh, that's beautiful. Nice. I want to edit it to put, and then there's comic relief. Yeah. <laughs> you got your, your turkey on, your bird bath. Yeah. So, so anyways, I want to thank you for coming today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank the club for letting me do this and inviting me to do this and being able to reschedule so quickly. I would like to thank Deanna for her assistance. Not only has she twice come to run the program and once been canceled, and also wow. brought, lent her computer to me. And I appreciate it very much. I hope you had a good time. Do you have any questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, so how can we be um, helpful to our native uh, bumblebees? Well, there's a number of ways. First of all, you need, I think one of the biggest things they're trying, starting to push right now is any little bit helps. If you have a pot of flowers that you can put out that would work for bees, it, it's a help more than grass, you know. And you've got to make sure, though, that your flower has all the parts. It ha you have to be able to see the, po the pollen on the little stamens and things. Because some flowers, if you've heard of a double flower, have been bred not to have stamens, to have more petals. Oh. And they will be of no interest to bees because they don't have anything good for them. So even if you have small corners, I'm, the, when I give the presentation at Ulbrich in, in two weeks, I'm going to talk about how just putting pots. I have a picture and I didn't include it in these, but a picture of a woman who lives in a condo, and out in, she has a two-car garage, apparently one car. And outside her garage are all these different pots of different plants, and that's her garden, because that's wow. all she has. But there's 24 doors of garages there. Imagine if everybody could put out a couple wow. pots. So anything can help. There's a big push also for native plants. The only problem with the native plants is they are mostly perennial. And that means you have to put them in the ground. The other thing is they tend to be short on the beginning and short on the end. There's no native prairie plants in bloom right now. There are no native um, prairie plants in bloom in September or October. So you need to fill in 
with other things. Annuals or perennials that bloom long. So, you know, anything can do. There are tons and tons of sites online about what plants to put in. And your experience will depend on what plants you have and what plants your neighbor have. Because certain, certain pollinators like certain things. For example, the monarch butterflies like tall things because their escape is to fly straight up. Um, hummingbirds like to be higher too, but bumblebees don't care, so shorter plants would work for them. Um, zinnias are great plants because they go pretty much until frost. So do petunias, so does calabrachia, um, superbelts, I think they're called. Um, so those are a, a lot of plants. Anything in the salvia family or the mint family are wonderful. Yes, ma'am. What about that profusion, you know, zinnia profusion? It's the one that a lot of people buy now. Oh, it's, it looks a little star flower. Small, small it's smaller, shorter. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's a little. It's a. Do you get bees or pollinators on it? I, I heard that that's not great in terms of the pollinators, but. Um, no, I, I would say not. But I, I would get if you go for some of the taller zinnias, yeah. maybe about this um, State Farm, cut and come again. Uh, uh, wait, State Fair, cut and come again. Um, you can look in the book. Anything to 20, 26 to thirty-six or more inches is great. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But, but just try to get something in bloom. And in the spring, ephemerals are good. Actually, you can use pansies. They're not great, but they will come if they find nothing else. There's, have you heard of the no mow may situation? OK. Unless you've got something cool in your lawn, it's useless. It, it creates a wonderful um, focus and no, you know, uh, creates interest. But grass don't doesn't do anything for pollinators. Even the little tiny flowers that are on the grass plant are they, they're, they're too small. Well, they're wind, wind pollinated. Yeah. yeah, so they don't need them. If, okay, how many people here have Creeping Charlie? Yeah. Leave it. Yeah. Leave it. It is a super bee feeder in the spring when nothing else is out. When you're sick of it, mow it off. You know, by the time other flowers come off, you don't need it. And I know people say, oh, it's hard to pull. It is, but if you, it, it kind of trails. If you can find the central part, you can get most of it out pretty much without having to dig constantly. Um, spring ephemerals, um, um, some bulbs, although not as many. Um, just, uh, just anything you can do. And then what about? Um, try, try for orange, red, and purple flowers. Yeah, that's cool. What about um, as far as ground cover or um, things to help them for nesting? Um, just, just leave areas undisturbed okay. is more. If, rake out the parts of your yard that um, didn't, um, that kind of piled up over winter. Leave them sit more until April, early May if you can, because there could be bumblebees nests. Okay hibernating in there. And just un undisturbed parts of logs, piles of wood, um, you know, if you've got areas under trees, you know, up along your, your house. But, you know, and, and watch for them. And if you see that they're there, you know, try to fence them off so you don't step in them or other people don't. You don't want to hurt, get hurt, you know, by allowing them to and be. Those, those um, little things you see with the tubes or reeds. Th those are excellent. Yeah, we just hung one up. Those are for some of the solitary bees, which are um, how many species did we say? 380 or something wow. like that? And it's single mothers that drop the egg and go. Okay. The important thing though, um, ours says to take it in over the winter and wasps will raid them. Okay. So you want to be careful on that and that, that can be helpful too. And a lot of the, sing the solitary bees that come out don't last real long. They're like, they, they basically come, drop their eggs and go. And they might last for two months or so. Other questions? Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with you.